Hey there, and thank you for tuning in to the third episode of Bandwidth Coast to Coast. This episode's guest, I find while trying to use social media as a pulse on politics in America. I hear the establishment messages from both factions, whether I want to or not. But what's the message on the ground? What ideas are being spread, and who are the ones speaking them? Consistently a thematic individual, I thought it'd be a good play following the last episode to make this one where we look forward on what could be. Plato said in the Republic, one of the penalties for refusing to participate in politics is that you end up being governed by your inferiors. What if, instead of sneering at elect- elected officials for being blatantly unfit individuals, people that were closer to a kind, loyal, persevering friend you may know were the ones who entered office? Culture is both what we do actively, but what we allow passively, and Rob is anything but passive. After listening to this episode, I encourage you to check out Rudyard Kipling's poem, If, and see if your mind quickly wanders to Rob. Kipling wrote the poem as a message to his grandson, but it could have easily been a story about Rob. Building a construction business, becoming successful, employing others, just to have the housing market and whole economy fall out from under you. People stop being able to pay for construction, business fails, Rob loses his home, and has to move his family to start over in Louisiana, with nothing but themselves and an old bass guitar. Succeeds again, and now is running for Congress. This was an incredibly inspiring conversation for me to have. One quick note, though, before it starts. This episode was recorded shortly after Hurricane Laura, and Rob was talking with me from the road after checking the damage to his house. So the connection comes out a few times, but we did our best to make it fluid. This episode is also going live shortly after Hurricane Delta knocks power out of Rob's house yet again. Frequent, intense weather. This is all just a start. But without further ado, my conversation with Rob Anderson, congressional candidate for Louisiana's 3rd District. Well, thanks again, Rob, for uh, for talking with me. I appreciate it. I know you're in in travel right now, so I appreciate taking a couple minutes to to chat with me. Absolutely. How's uh How's your day going? In Laura, a couple weeks back uh, down here in Southwest Louisiana, so we've been evacuees out to the city of Lafayette, uh, which is about two hours away from where we live uh, in De Quincey, which is north of Lake Charles in Southwest Louisiana. And our power just came back on. So uh, this visit was a good one. We were going up to visit our house and the power is back. So we're going to be able to move back home. So it's a good day. Yeah, that definitely is a, a good way to start. So what is that? Like uh, 10 days, 12 days without power? Uh, let's see. It came in on a Thursday and today's Monday. So two weeks plus whatever that would be. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, wow. 17 days. 17 days. Yeah. Wow. Uh, it, it's been a little while, yeah. Um, and I hear tell, I just saw on the news, there are still around 100,000 uh, without power in southwest Louisiana. So uh, yeah, wow. we're, we're among the fortunate ones. There's still a lot of us down here who were, uh, you know, negatively affected. And a lot of people don't have clean drinking water, which we didn't lose our water pipe. So, you know, we... As things could go, it, it could be much worse. A lot of people lost houses. Uh, a few people died immediately afterwards. We were fortunate. So. Yeah, wow. That's, uh, that's really shocking. You know, um, something that I think about a lot is how much we take for granted our infrastructure, oh, especially power and, and water. Um, I was, well, I, I would say that I was fortunate enough to see the unfortunate event in Flint shortly after it happened. I went and visited there. Sure. Um, and that really shook me at how quickly all of a sudden we could not have access to water or even the water we do have access to could be harming us. So I, what, you know, what is the issue with the water? Is it just the, did the storm like overflow or burst some pipes or what exactly happened? Uh, it must've been pipe damage. Uh, mm-hmm. Now, one of the fortunate things about our region is just last year they had gone through and redone all the water pipes. So ours were fairly new in my neighborhood. Um, before that, and you know, in a lot of the rural areas, I'm sure it was older pipe systems that uh, the uh, 
storm water over, you know, the water table here, it's Louisiana. The water table over here is basically you stick your shovel in the ground and you, you're in the water. Uh, you know, the water table is pretty high here. So anytime you get storm overflow, there's a, there's a chance uh, for some of the older systems that it gets contaminated, gets into the drinking water. Um, so you know, what they do immediately is they issue a boil order, which means you know that it's not all being processed. Uh, so until so they sort out where, where the leaks are and overflow came from, but uh, ours is just fairly, we never lost water, thank goodness. So yeah, I'm grateful for uh, that. I um, so I uh, it's, yeah, a, but you're but you're right. You know, we take a lot of things we take for granted. Yeah. And now in Louisiana, we realize we have an all new power grid. They had to rebuild almost the entire thing. Uh, there were, you know, almost every telephone pole when we first came back the day after the hurricane was smashed, knocked over, cables in the roads, trees, and, you know, all the power lines, including the high tension aluminum ones, which from the 150 mile an hour winds folded in half, which is an amazing sight. I had a picture of that that I tweeted out. I was going to say, actually, I saw that picture months. of yours. Yeah, I saw that yeah, picture. Yeah. That's, that's crazy. That's high tension. Yeah, it's high tension, you know, yep. metal like that is, it takes an awful lot to twist it and bend it down like that. Um, hey, hey you know, man, yeah, as a matter of fact, if I would be driving by it right now, if it was still down, but yeah, it's in this area. We're a bit south of home now. This is uh, actually Westlake, Louisiana. I'm driving by all the oil and gas plants, just giving y'all a roaming tour as we move along. Yeah, I appreciate it. <laughs> to keep it. it interesting and lively for you. I, oh. I'm appreciating it. So uh, that's yeah. interesting, though. That, that I'm happy to hear that it's building back that quickly. It is. Um, but and how how have you seen that? Well, I have a twofold question for you. Uh, one, how sure. have you seen that like response now versus hurricanes in the past? Like, is that happening faster? And then the other one is: Are they building it back as a band aid to get it back to where it was, or are they building it back better so that if there is another storm that comes through? You know, it's not another down aluminum power line. It, it was it a, you're asking if they did a reinvestment. Okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, the answer to the first question is no, actually. The FEMA response here was lackluster at best. They uh, immediately after the storm, typically during a FEMA operation under a competent administration, shall we say, uh, there are uh, trailers and resources and uh, command teams that are staged to especially with hurricanes because you you know you know they're coming a couple of days ahead of time uh they're usually staged right outside of the affected zone uh shortly ahead of so that as soon as the storm passes they know that people are going to be without power without drinking water without uh without home a lot of them right. and they bring trailers and tents and and resources and teams and you know there's no health clinics because uh hospitals run on generators but they aren't exactly seeing new patients if they can avoid it so it's basically that FEMA is supposed to be there so that the American way of life that we think of a first world response never breaks down. Well, in our case, um, it broke down. There, there, there was no FEMA response. It's the day after it was Louisianans and you know our own National Guard who were out literally pulling trees out of the roads and clearing paths. You know, when I first drove back after the hurricane the next morning, we couldn't get to our house because so many trees and power lines in the road. And, uh, wow. you know, our local municipalities, the power company was actually out there pulling out trees as we pulled up and then we could get to our house. And then we discovered that, you know, there had been no damage, but there was no power either. Right. Um, wow. That's, uh, that's interesting. Uh, so, I, I hadn't heard that. I haven't heard that, you know, like it, the, I think one of the zeitgeists and kind of tales of our time is, with how much overwhelming amount of information is out there, how much gets lost because of that, right? Like, oh, amen. And then we have such a rapid news cycle that, you know, the day after the hurricane, everybody was like, well, that's the hurricane. Now we're on to, right. you know, uh, fires. our military are losers and suckers. And, yes, and, you know, we yes. got fires. Yes. Right. Now Washington and Oregon is evacuating. <laughs> right. So, yeah, I, I, I understand the national media's point of view, but uh, I've never stopped talking about it. Uh, because, you know, we live it every every right. other day. Like I said, we drive in. Uh, today, uh, some other part of my team is actually in the other part of town still donating because uh, there's still people without power. We're still donating uh, today with cleaning supplies and washcloths and, and laundry detergent, stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, people that haven't been able to wash their clothes for two weeks. You know, wow. the stuff about life that you forget, the on-the-ground stuff. So that's what we're doing today. Another team is doing that while we were so that to free up my time because so that I could uh, at least talk to y'all, uh, you know, while I'm driving. So, yeah, I, I appreciate can. that. And 
and shout out to the Rob mob sure. helping all that out. Um, <laughs> yep, so that I, was the Rob mob. I want to, I want to back up a little bit. So, um, as a part of sure. this podcast that I'm doing and an app that's going to launch with it and all that, um, I've been doing like a, a, a project research study on the media for several years. Um, I think I'm in year number five. Um, but around like 2018, like middle of 2018, maybe later 2018, um, you popped up on my, on like my study. So I was like going through this crawling of social media networks, looking for like anomalies that kind of pop, pop out, out of the norm. And your profile was one of them that came on there. Um, so ever since then, actually, I've been kind of following you closely. Um, and I have to say, like, I find your feed to be so refreshing and like what you just said. So like, you know, the media, the national news media and kind of like the you know, storm that we all kind of get sucked into as a part of that, a lot of what happens yeah. in these pockets completely gets drowned out. So what I've tried to do is have voices in set, you know, different areas or of the country or, you know, sure. interests in, in industry. And I've really appreciated kind of getting your perspective on the ground. And I mean, right here's a great example of it. Um, so I kind of wanted to take it back a little bit back to, I think you announced in 2018 that you were going to run, right? Well, I, <clears throat> excuse me. Do we have a water? Yeah. Get a water here. Um, I, I ran in 2018. That was mm -hmm. the first run. That was sort of my protest run. Mm. Um, we were unknown as a driller uh, who my kids were off to college then. And, and I was really fed up with politics that really, you know, I've never been political most of my life. I always vote and I volunteered for the uh, Bill Clinton campaign back in 92 when I was young and idealistic and that sort of thing. But I was never actively involved in politics um, until the point where it's like, all right, somebody's got to do something. This has really gone beyond, you know, uh, grifters in Washington. This is like an absolute threat to our democracy. So I got involved. And, and that was sort of our protest, Ron. And then as I found out when I was doing it, from my own take, that it, I, I thought I was pretty good at it. You know what I mean? I was like, you know, I might be able to do this. So the next time I spent uh, developing our social media platform, developing how to talk to people, um, sort of reinventing the wheel, not using the old uh, methods, but right. actually just using data to say, well, you know, if you want to reach people, you got to reach them. And there's Facebook, which I didn't trust. Um, but then I discovered Twitter, which I'd had an account, but I didn't use it much. And I found a way that my form of messaging apparently uh, resonates with it, you know, resonates within the platform that is sort of naturally uh, suited for me. And then just started building this national following. Um, and and kind of here we are. And not to mention, uh, staying informed and learning about what being a congressperson actually does, uh, all of which was helpful. And so, yeah, we are anomalous. It's interesting that we popped up on that study. Yeah, uh, yeah. It's, it's been really great. I'm watching. trying to set a, I'm trying to set a pattern for other people in Louisiana specifically, because we are so uh, entrenched on who uh, gets elected here. It's really more than other districts. Maybe uh, I can only speak for mine right now really in control of the corporate interest. Um, mm -hmm. They absolutely, who decides to get elected prior to this. And now I've got somebody who, you know, you got somebody, me, who absolutely does not take corporate money and doesn't have to. And therefore all I have to do is speak the truth to the people and it resonates. So. Uh, yeah, you're, you're. We'll see if uh, it works on, on election day, but you know. It really I, does seem to be working because it was, you know, we're freaking famous now. So, you know, hey. I have a strong feeling it's going to turn out very well for you in November. Uh, yeah, it's uh, the revolution is coming, brother. Yeah, and you're definitely leading the charge in Louisiana. In um, Louisiana, I am. Yeah. So I, I wanted to I, I want to come back to that when you were young and idealistic comment with Bill Clinton for a second. Oh, but before yeah, yeah. before that, I want ninety two. <laughs> I want to mention um, some of your backstory. So I was reading that. Your, uh, your dad was in the Navy and you moved around a lot. Yeah. Yeah? Yeah, I didn't really have a, a home base. Uh, I grew up mostly in the South, but I bounced around. I was actually born in California. Um, not from there. I left when I was three months old, but that's where I was actually born, on a Navy base in California. Uh, Rhode Island, Texas, Virginia, Florida, twice. Uh, uh, Maryland, Pennsylvania, I've been all over. Uh, so it really gives me a perspective on uh, Americans and this is, is me talking here, 
Americans are really the same all over. The only thing that's different is one, a couple of local eating habits. Those do vary a lot from state to state. And the other is uh, what your neighbors think, uh, kind of is how I would put it. Um, you can blame uh, the media, and I do. The local media is going to um, gear towards what people want to hear. Mm -hmm. So down here, it's a very conservative but independent sort of populist. So we're not a red state. We're a non-voting state. People down mm -hmm. here don't trust the government. They think it's not working for them. And so all they hear is the national national ugh, national messaging, um, and and not the truth. It's you know right. they're, the Democrats are you know socialists. It's like I'm not a socialist, you know, or Democrats are this or that. So they 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 really are a product of the media down here is very conservative because that's who pays the bills. You know they want things to keep going the way they are because it is set up. Our state is set up very well for oil and gas. It's just how it is. It was our first big strong business and has been for a while. Uh, but a lot of people don't even realize while it is a big strong business here, it's not the only business, you know, and right. there are other ways of life. The health industry is actually, healthcare is actually a bigger business in my district than is uh, oil and gas. And, and so is uh, education. So why aren't we spending money on those things? is you know kind of my approach when i first started running why are we spending on healthcare and education you want to help people in district more people work in healthcare right, right. just numbers and also and, there's uh, less second and third say, order oh, yeah, effects yeah. my right. brothers well and and you know without addressing the propaganda i don't even have to right. i just change the argument that's smart and, and that's a lot of been i'm a smart guy <laughs> that's a lot of been a lot of uh our messaging is like, I'm not going to argue your point. I'm going to argue mine. And then you can't disavow it because I'm not arguing an opinion. I'm yeah, arguing I, facts. I, I really, I've resonated with that. I, I've seen that on Twitter and uh, kind of my, my thinking in like the political discourse now, because my, uh, my family are in lobbying. And so I've kind of grown up understanding the skeletons in all sides of the parties. And personally, I just kind of reject, sure. I reject party, you know, lines altogether in my own personal ideology and instead i try to bring arguments up a dimension right so you want to argue about right. that but i'm going to say no, no no i think this there's a broader issue and i'm going to bring it up to that and then let's talk about that and, and, and I that think is, that's what you're doing and that's great yeah you're on the right path i was <laughs> i was an independent for 31 years um again i sort of chose sides in 2018 is what it came down to uh, the democratic party has a lot of flaws and you're not going to hear me be their biggest cheerleader but right now I, I feel they are the better option because of what's happened. Excuse me, what's happened to the GOP currently? I, On I the other hand, more. yeah. Yeah. Um, but as I said, I was an independent until halfway through the last race. And I was like, you know what? Political messaging is simple. It really has to be. Uh, one of the first lessons I heard from the first political pro I hired told me, keep it on an eighth grade level. Now, I listened to that sometimes. But when you look at political ads, that's what they're game, game, gamed at. Very simple language, very straightforward, mm -hmm. usually simple issues. Well, we can do complex issues if you break them down and still do them on an eighth grade level. Yeah. And if people want an additional level of detail and you want to raise that discourse and you want to get down to the nitty gritty, well, I've done the reading. I'll do that. We can get down to the mud. But on the surface, you know, that's why Republicans have been better traditionally at messaging flag family guns yes. god they literally just simplify things down to that well you know democrats aren't anti-god or anti-family or you know it's just the republicans have claimed those issues and then you have to prove them wrong which right. means you're attacking right the, the flag or the family right. as opposed so, to what you're again, doing it was just saying let's let's not even talk about that let's talk about the real yeah, issue that's not an issue no, you, right is there a you know there's a quote from west wing that my wife uses all the time and i've started to say is there a sudden, you know, rash of flag burning happening in this country <laughs> that I need to be aware of? What, only in political campaigns is suddenly an issue again. Let's make flag burning illegal. Well, right. it is an expression of the First Amendment. It's been upheld right. by the Supreme Court. And not only that, it's not an issue. Nobody's right. really burning flags. So stop acting like, you know, you're righteous for opposing uh, something to make you seem more patriotic. It's a dumb argument. And my take is to point out that it's a dumb argument 
Yeah, no, I, I actually think about that quote. Every, I think about that quote every yeah. time someone argues burning a flag. Actually. Right. <laughs> yeah, I love the West Wing. Aaron Sorkin had a lot of things right. Yeah, um, I actually, I said this morning on Twitter that I think Aaron Sorkin is the gold standard for screenwriting. Absolutely. And then yeah, he did that, that opening speech in the newsroom. I was actually uh, talking about that speech. <laughs> yeah. We, we played it last night at the campaign meeting. I, I have a new social media person coming on board. Uh, who's going to help me with uh, Facebook and alternative, you know, obviously we're doing Twitter fine, but anyway, uh, we all talked about that. So we played it on, uh, played That's it great. on the smartphone, you know, played that opening sequence. We're not the greatest country in the world, but we could be. We should right, be. Right. Right. You know? Yeah. And I agree. And I've been, uh, I've traveled a lot. I don't know if you know that from, uh, but uh, over the years we vacation in Europe and, and, you know, all the time. And uh, I don't think people here in the U.S. realize we're not quite a first world country anymore. Right. Uh, not like we think we are. You go to Germany and you see how amazingly clean everything is, and, you know, and everything's new and well built. And it's like, wow, I'm, I feel like I'm in Disneyland, but it's a country. Uh, and, you know, the U.S. is lagging behind in a lot of things. And they don't realize it's just the decades of not investing in ourselves and investing in, in only wealthy interest but not putting money back into infrastructure and preparing our kids to you know my kids are growing up in a second world nation not a first world i grew up in first world and it's not fair uh you know we did lead the world at one time we could do it again and we could do it without you know wasting money on you know bombing people right <laughs> right there's no, so I'm many things we could do that are positive uh, to rebuild our country. Yeah, and, and I've liked, I, I liked a lot of the things that I've seen you come up that you've, you've mentioned. Like one of them was uh, capping oil wells in Louisiana. How that would yeah, that's uh, I mean, we have it, it, somebody somebody posted that analysis for me. An engineer, one of my uh, one of my followers who's in district, who's an engineer, uh, said, you know, the on the ground stuff. That's where you're going to win this argument because people don't know, uh, you know, how the Senate works down here mm -hmm. for the most part they just don't care and some people up in dc doing something that you know i think most of america that way they really don't know how the senate works or how the house works or, or what the president actually does but they understand you got a job for a year you know going around capping oil wells that's language they understand and one it helps the environment right. two it helps hold uh corporations accountable because they're supposed to cap these damn things when they drill them by the way um and three it employs somebody and a, and a string of somebody's you know that's not and that's just one of the uh many that you're investing back into your state and helping people and helping the economy all together why aren't we doing that well because oil companies don't want to pay for their mess same with the ten thousand miles of uh, dredge canal we have opening up the atchafalaya base and all these dredge canals they drill you know they dredge to new drill sites part of their contract they're supposed to fill them back in after after the, you know, the well, it's done. they don't, they just leave them open. So this screws up all your wetland systems. And uh, Chafalaya is the um, largest freshwater basin in the continental US, you know, wow. it's not nothing. And you were the sports no, and, and I mean, wet, wetlands are, wetlands are incredibly important for water stability, water purification. Yeah, thank <laughs> uh, yeah no, it's huge. Right. Yeah. And, and it's things like that. It's like, well, okay. I, you know, I, I think I see your problem here. Right. One of many, and then, again. yeah, and then flooding, of course, is a massive issue. And what do they do here? They blame insurance companies. Uh, you know, it's like, okay, well, we could also manage it so that maybe it doesn't flood as much. How about that? Instead of trying to rebuild your house after, why don't you protect your house from being flooded in the first place? Well, it almost like it goes. It's almost like that argument we were making about. Uh... Oh, did I lose you? No, I can hear. You. Oh, okay, it's almost like that argument that we were making about uh, arguing directly at each other versus moving a dimension up, right? So we're arguing with each other about the problem, and the problem right now is that I need to rebuild my house, not necessarily the problem right. I really should be talking about is that I should be planning for when this happens again. Right, and here we did it again. Oh, and I only answered, I think, half your question before when I said, you asked me a two-part question about FEMA, are they responding? And my answer was sort of. And the other part was, the infrastructure they rebuilt, they did have to rebuild. Uh, I don't know the statistics yet. Everybody says they rebuilt the entire power grid. I know it feels like that. Uh, however, they rebuilt it in the same way that it was. Right. So I will say they did not upgrade anything 
while they were at it, they literally took wooden poles and replaced wooden poles and just put the wires back up. So you were still vulnerable to the next hurricane. I mean, like Hurricane right. Sally's coming right now. Thank goodness for us anyway. That it's going to hit east. You know, right now we should be thinking of the people in Mississippi who are about to get affected. But if Hurricane Sally had come and hit here right the day I got my power back, one, that would be a very 2020 thing of it to do. But two, uh, the power could be knocked out just as easily as it was before. Right. And, and just as a note, when we're recording this, there's five tropical cyclones that are currently in the Atlantic Ocean, which is something that's only no, happened goody. twice uh, in, the, in the record. So, I mean, it, the, the reason I bring it up is... nothing to do with climate change, though. It's uh, no, couldn't it? Couldn't no, it possibly? Just yes. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, the fire tornadoes in Washington or California. Yeah. Did you see that, those videos yet? I did. Yeah, no, those were pretty crazy. Uh, you know, it's the, insane. This is yeah. like a science fiction movie, and this is happening right now. We have the most inept, incompetent, you know, obtuse person in the world running the country while it's happening. Uh, so, yeah, you got to get out and vote in 50 days, y'all. You got to do yes, it. Got to do definitely. it. Definitely. Definitely got to vote. I don't care also, if you don't like in... Biden. He's better than Trump. Yeah, I think, um, I think right now we got to worry about economies of scale. Because I think our problems with climate change, the economy, healthcare, those are all problems of economies of scale. And I think when you're right. dealing with economies of scale, you often have to make the best decision that you possibly can. And while I personally right. can That's say a lot of reasons why I wouldn't want to vote for Joe Biden, I'm going to because I think of economy. I think I think we need stability, and I think especially in you know international norms, in, internal norms, and also I think you know honestly yeah, I think this is a really funny comment that I heard somebody say, and it was. Uh, I'm not voting for Trump because Trump makes people crazy. And I think that that's a good thing to bring up too. And that's really true. I want a president who doesn't, you know, tweet stream of consciousness 10 times a day. You know, right. I want him actually out there working on the job, hiring good people. Uh, yeah, that, that's in the business world. They call that a macro decision. Right. Uh, that Biden is the macro decision, the stability. And as people say, a return to normalcy. Well, there is no more normalcy. Yes. Uh, we have a pandemic. We have now an additional $7 trillion of debt that we did a few years ago. Uh, we still haven't addressed student debt. Nobody is, you know, uh, codified healthcare fully. We still have a country whose infrastructure had a 50 year lifespan and is now 20 years overdue. Right. Uh, that's a big problem here. All these things we need to be worried about. I don't care about a wall to Mexico. Immigration on the whole is a net positive. So that's the extent of what I think about immigration. So they have more immigration lawyers and, and streamline the process. They're going to be easier to immigrate. Yes. But I think more immigration makes America greater. So this entire public discourse has been a waste of our time for four years, but we have real problems. going on. Yeah, I think you're right. You know, we have an impending ecological uh, collapse that we're kind of getting ignored right. out in the zeitgeist that is currently happening. And, and I think I really like what you just said, because kind of my mantra I've been telling people whenever they ask me about it is, um, normal actually isn't normal. So the normal that we've been experiencing for like pretty much my whole life, right? A lot of my life has been relatively normal, right? But in the arc of human history, turbulence is what's normal, not normal. So the, the anomaly is actually the past 35, 40 years of relative stability, not the present and, year of uh, chaos. Yeah. In, in, uh, You're breaking up, Rob. Yeah. Oh, okay. I got you now. Okay, so this is where it cut out. There I said go. norm. I said I said normal is turbulence, and I, I, I then that's it. You cut out right there. So if you want to start from the beginning again, I'm really excited because it cut in and out. I heard ragonomics and I heard a couple of things, and I was like, No, Rob, where'd you go? Where'd you go? <laughs> I could hear you for a bit, but I was I was trying to translate, but it's hard to do without sound. That <laughs> we're in that dead zone uh, between cell towers on I-10, so that we should be good from here. It's pretty populated. Beautiful. Uh, but there was a spot for. Yeah, and I'm right next to us out there, so we should have good signal. Uh, yeah, I, my what my response was is I do believe, having lived it, that this started with Reaganomics in the 80s and the push that, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the wealthy doing well means the country is doing well. Um, never mind the reality and the union breaking that happened at that time, that if the wealthy uh, are successful, then the country must be doing great. And of course, the wealthy being the ones who donate to political campaigns, they keep paying for that message, you know? Which we're is something we're seeing a lot right now with everybody talking about Wall Street and 
the stocks. Right, and, which matters to 1%. Between right. 1 and 10% of the country gives a damn that the Wall Street, that Wall Street is being propped up by Steve, you know, by Mnuchin and Trump. Um, right, and Wall Street trillion. is not the economy, right? The economy is not, not the not stock the market. Right, uh, not even to mention getting into the GDP or the percentage of debt or real wages, which haven't changed since 1972. Or even just like uh, gross levels of happiness and despair, because despair yeah. levels are going off the charts. And if you look at healthcare uh, data with despair data, you start seeing a pretty strong correlation between those two. Right. Uh, we've lived in this period of uncertainty where it seems like our country wants to kill us and justify it. <laughs> That's kind of what it feels like to people. From what I've heard, it's like my country is trying to kill me. It would rather I would be either working full time and you know, and spending my money at the company store or just die and go away. Um, and that's, that's, that's unique in human history, American history, from my experience. I've 100%. never felt my country just didn't give a damn uh, as much as it feels lately. So I'm trying to tell my kids, it was a pretty cool country to live in for most of my life. So I, I don't know what to tell you right now. It's, it's pretty harsh, you know. And then that's another reason I do what I do is so that my kids will, I can, I can look them in the eye and, you know, dad's trying to do something. I'm trying to fix it. I'm trying to fix it. I think that's, um, I think that's beautiful. I, I think um, there's, there's a, a phrase that I say every now and then again now, um, and it's uh, nihilism abound. Because I think that right now, like just general nihilistic expression is of an ideology is something that I, it's just, it's everywhere. And it's, it's so in your face. It's almost like it, it's hard to see. Um, which also, I think, goes to explain what you were saying in Louisiana, that the largest voting bloc is actually not voters, which is which is the case in all of America, actually. It just seems like it might be a little more hyper-dominant in your area. Right. It really is. I uh, think about one-third of our state never votes. Um, there's, a, there's a political meme going around, uh, Cthulhu 2020, no lives matter, uh, <laughs> which, which kind of summarizes that... Uh, take on it that ultimately um, we have to look out for each other because the universe doesn't <laughs> the universe isn't giving us any time 99.99 percent of everything that ever lived is now dead so you know we're trying to look out for ourselves because we're not getting any help from uh from the outside and so like-minded people running the company store so to speak getting in government, trying to make good decisions for each other is the only way we can, I, I don't know if you can legislate empathy, but I really think you should. That Otherwise, we're not a society. Let's not call it a society. We're a yeah. society. we got to work together. We've got to cooperate. We're not all in competition with each other. Yeah, uh, I, th I think that's and, great. And, and I think you know, the best way for a republic to function is if the, those that govern best reflect the governed. And I think you getting in there is a, a great example of that, as well as kind of the ideology that you're exemplifying. And, and as a part of that, I think it's a really interesting part of your history that you've been on the business and the working side. So I, I saw that you started two sure. companies, one you sold and one you lost during the recession, and that you've also been yep. a union worker. I, I was wondering if, if yep. the, the, the business that you had during the reception, recession that, that uh, went under, I was wondering if you wouldn't mind kind of touching on that and what that experience was like and how that's kind of shaped both your thinking and, and your life to get you where you are now. Well, uh, uh, one thing it's taught me is that no matter how badly you get knocked down, you can get back up again. Uh, you can recover. Yeah, we, we, uh, we're doing well. Um, let's see in the nineties, I was in the print company that did well and we sold that and got out of New York and uh, went to Maryland. And then that's where I got out of IT and into construction uh, because I was just, I wanted to pan. And then once I got into construction, I realized that it was kind of like, uh, you know, in the kingdom of the blind, the one-eyed man could be king. Uh, or, you know, the hard work that is, is reflexes, but, the management techniques, perhaps you'd say, that uh, banks and bigger businesses use work just as well in the working class if you just throw an occasional damn it in there. You know, that's about the only difference. <laughs> so every time I, I started at a concrete company, at a drilling company, and each one in six months, 
I'd kind of be running the show or be one of the leads. And it just kept working my way up. And then I was like, well, I can do this. So I started a home building business, uh, custom homes. What time did um, you start? Of, what year did you start it? That was 03, okay. 04. So uh, the, the yeah. housing is starting to really ramp. Well, that's, that was at the housing bubble. And unfortunately, right. my line of work was home building. <laughs> um, this is one where I wish historically that I'd paid more attention to the stock market and the, and the junk bond market uh, that I didn't know about at the time, uh, knowing that the bubble was about to burst. But nevertheless, uh, I, I went under because uh, all, all of our life savings, my wife and I, uh, were tied up in this company and the uh, customers stopped paying me in the middle of the job. And uh, I had to pay all the expenses. I had to pay off a $40,000 Amex card and all this was out of my money because it was a one-man show, you know, kind of like your make or break project and it right. was a break, not a make. Um, and so all our money went under and I, we lost our house. And the only thing I kept was my car that. and my guitar. Hey, hey, that was years ago, recovered. But yeah, when the, when it, when the bubble burst, yeah, we were you know, penniless and I had three years to you know, I worked my way back and then I went back into drilling and dug our way back into the middle class, I guess you'd say the working class. Um, but having owned another business since then, uh, didn't get back into that. I just realized I'd rather work for people. But, you know, somebody's got to be in government looking out for people. So the, the, that kind of gambling with everybody's life savings and mortgages doesn't happen. Why isn't anybody regulating banks? Uh, that was one of the big ones, you know? Yeah. Wow. That's an amazing story. Um, there's a, a poem that I'm very fond of, uh, by Rudyard Kipling called if I'm not sure if you're familiar with it, but he has a line. I, in I it. know some Kipling. Yeah. He, he has a line in it that says, if you can pick yourself up with worn and broke at broken tools. And that's, it's, mm. this seems a lot like what you just did. You, you went for it. You tried, you really tried to make a business again. You were doing really well. And then the world, you know, fell out under you and you still picked everything up with a, nothing but a guitar and a car and a wife and a family and started all over again. And here you are running for Congress. Damn. Is that if that's not a American story, <laughs> right? It's the American dream is what I said that, you know, we go up and we drop back and then get back up, do it again. Yeah. So uh, how much did that affect your, where you are now and wanting to run? Like, I mean, obviously, like having a, the, the two questions I want to ask you. So is, you know, you are a parent and you are a parent of somebody, a parent of that has gone through some an economic shock like that, where you've had to really start start over again. And and I mean, being a parent through that, I couldn't imagine how difficult that was. Um, and, and to see how your character came out the other side of it. So, so whole and, 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 and varied is very inspiring, honestly. Um, and I just wonder how much that forms your passion that I hear right now and kind of what was your life like after you know building yourself back into that kind of what were what, what did you see the effects of that well um I think that um uh, character as you call it is uh part of what prompted me to run because it was the uh ultimately it came down to the expression if you want something to do done right you do it yourself and I see all these uh you know part of my language shithead congress people you know corporate sellouts and I was like is it not possible in this country that a decent person can't get into Congress? I mean, is that not possible? There was that, that was the entire question that made me uh, view politics. It's like, I'm not the best at anything. I'm pretty good at jobs and, you know, I do have a, definitely a, a, a persistence um, at getting tasks done. I'm very goal oriented. So, which is why, you know, employers loved me when, you know, whatever job I did, I tried to be the best at it. That was, I wasn't competing with other people. I'm competing with myself. I always want to, anything worth doing is worth doing well, my dad told me, and that stuck with me. Um, so that, uh, what was the actual question underlying that? I think you answered it. You said that, that oh, okay. you had your own personal philosophy has always been to just persevere and to, yeah. if nothing is worth doing it, it's, it's always doing it your best, which I, I, I really resonate with uh, the, I'm, I'm, I dub myself a philosopher and there's a lot of ancient Greek philosophy I like a lot. And the concept that you're, you're hitting on is arte is how they say in Greece, but really it's excellence. And it's, I don't want to do anything unless I'm doing it with excellence. And that could be and the thing I always use to kind of explain this to people is 
I wash the dishes with excellence. That sounds, it sounds banal and stupid, right? But it's like, no, no, I'm going to do the best job at washing the dishes I possibly can because doing the best job at washing right. the dishes I possibly can is going to make me better in everything else in my life. I didn't realize the Greeks had done that first. I did it. Uh, it started out originally. I dropped out of high school when I was 16 and it was originally my dad told me, well, you're not going to make anything of your life if you drop out of school. So I, it was originally like, uh, you know, hold my beer, watch, you know, <laughs> I'm going to do this. So I went back, obviously I went back, got my degree and went to college. But all that was basically like, don't tell me I can't do something then I'm going to do it just to spite you. Right. And, and, and in case that sounds contentious, my dad and I have a great relationship now. But <laughs> at the time, he was, you know, he's a 20 year neighbor man. You have to do it by the book or it doesn't work. I'm like, well, watch. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, I'm not like your dad. We're different. We're, we're similar in something. We're different. Other. My dad's very uh, anal, very dry. He's an engineer. Uh, and, it, you know, he's had multiple careers. Uh, he's a renaissance man. So to me, it was always trying to be like, how can I not try to be good at everything I do? My dad is the best at everything. Played minor league baseball and, you know, wow. fired nuclear missiles in the Navy and, you know, had done all this stuff and do a little boy that that's very impressive. So that, and I've tried to teach my son the same lessons. If you're doing the dishes, do them really well. There's no reason to do them otherwise. And the same, you know, I've, I've job <laughs> in a print shop that weighed like 200 pounds because all these wet inks they throw in and at the end of the day it's piles and anyway that was my first day's work trying to haul these garbage cans outside and that was the company that you know eight years later i partnered in a co-owner of. so you know wow that is the american dream but the dream is not to like be horatio you're breaking up again rob I think we're between cell towers like, again. Hang on one second. Okay. Uh, you're coming back now. Oh, uh, you can hear me? I can hear you now. Yeah, I think I think we're almost like on okay. a cadence every 20 minutes. You're between cell towers. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it is a long stretch here, but there is another major town coming up. So I figured it would be okay. I didn't know if there's – I've never done a live uh, Zoom, video Zoom between here before. So you're the first. So. Well, it's going pretty uh, well. I mean, even with a couple of things, I can I can edit out those trunks. That's fine. Um, that's that's awesome. So you were saying that yeah, you know, and I really wish I could have been in the office and all dressed up. But you know, time, that's okay. time is precious. This close to the election, time is precious. Time is precious, and I, I like the motif of you on the move, anyways. So it's okay. Uh, yeah. Awesome. No, that's great though. So you said you started. I think that the gist of what I caught is that you started working, taking garbage out at the print shop, and then eight years later, you were a partner. A co-owner. Yeah. A co-owner. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and uh, I had, uh, well, I had revolutionized, that was at the transition from, uh, I don't know how much about, know about printing, but the way you had literally the old style lead print machines down in the basement, you know, the letter presses, um, they had just started on lithography, which was on plates and all that. And anyway, that was a digital revolution. Desktop publishing started at that time when I was in that business. So I converted us from, the uh, quick print shop into a digital quick print shop. Uh, so I was there at that trend and that's how I got into the IT work. I had to figure out how to, I didn't know what a LAN was and I had to figure it out and set up a network and all these huge digital print was part of that transition. And uh, we rolled with the times and uh, yeah, that, that business went very well. We sold out to a major conglomerate and I left New York. Wow, what a what a great blueprint for a congressman! Somebody who's able to see things changing, learn about them, and adapt with them. That's uh, that's great. So, uh, I I want to ask you two questions before I let you go while we had a little bit of time here. Um, so first, I saw prison reform was one of the the You're almost things. convincing me that I should run for Congress. <laughs> sure. <laughs> if, o- if only if I was in uh, Louisiana, you'd definitely be getting my vote there, Rob. <laughs> I appreciate that. Um, uh, yeah, prison reform, criminal justice reform. You want me to just go on about it? Or did you? Yeah. Well, I, well the, what, I wanted to, what I wanted to ask as a primer of the prison reform is why did you? Why is that something that's worth noting for you on your campaign? And what what is your kind of thoughts on what where the reform is and what needs? Oh, to okay. Well, uh, openly pro legalization of cannabis in the deep south. Uh, because we look at from uh, 
you can't have uh, social justice without economic justice. Um, laws down here in the Jim Crow regions typically are used to suppress the part of the population that they don't want to deal with. Minority man is three times more likely to be locked up for a joint than I am. Um, and private prisons are a way to make money off of human misery. So all of that needs to be reformed because we in course. Um, all right, it's off now. Yeah, no. Uh, so what were you saying again? I, I didn't get most of that. You said uh, the uh, private oh, okay. prisons uh, were, uh, I think the last thing I heard was private prisons uh, profit off of misery. Yeah, um, private prisons, I don't think it should exist because I don't think we should as a society, especially one that purports to be civilized, should profit off of human misery. I think if we have to, uh, and we do, I mean, people break laws, if we have to incarcerate people for crimes, they should not be for nonviolent crimes in general, and certainly not for cannabis. So, and the only reason they're perpetuated as, as it becomes clear is because we feed the prison pipeline, which is how they get a lot of cheap labor because the 13th Amendment uh, outlaws slavery except when they're in prison. So right. prison labor is slave labor. And I don't, you know, I don't think you could can disconnect any part of that. You have to treat them all as a whole. So you need to legalize cannabis, stop arresting people for stupid stuff. Let's get people productive and let's stop profiting off the of human misery. And prison, private prisons donate to political campaigns, specifically Republican. So it's all a cycle of money like anything else. Just follow the money. Yeah, I think... Um... I really appreciate the way that you look at a lot of issues because you, you, you tend to look at them from all the different, you know, uh, yeah. I, I look at things economically a lot, right? So like, what are the incentives yeah. and decentives, right? Because right. there's push and pulls and everything, right? Um, and, and I think that that's a, that's a really great point. Like you can't look at, you know, the criminalization of drugs without also looking at the incentives for cheap labor, without looking at the incentives right. for private prisons, without looking at the incentives for campaign donation. Like it's, it's definitely a, a web of compounding factors that you know, right. make a little bit of noise in one also, of them. Right. And that's also how people say, well, why does nothing ever change? Well, nothing ever changes. If you keep voting for the same stuff, you may have a candidate who's really good looking and he says the same things everybody else does, but you're like, I really like him. Well, nothing's going to change. You know, you got to vote for somebody who actually wants it to be different. Somebody who doesn't profit from the way it is, which is why, you know, my initial big issue, except nobody really cares. They say they do, but they don't is, you know, getting corporate money out of politics. Uh, everybody complains about it, except nobody ever does anything about it. What would you do if you, if I gave you a magic wish, what would you do? I would overturn Citizens United in a heartbeat and say the corporations donations to political campaigns are not free speech because <laughs> they aren't, mm -hmm. uh, not to mention, uh, what was it in 77, uh, the Vallejo case that started the, uh, opening the door for, uh, I don't know the specifics of that off the top of my head, uh, but it did open the door for corporate finance. So I would reform these things because I don't think corporations should donate. Can a rich person donate? Sure. You know, Jeff Bezos should be able to donate $2,800 to a federal campaign just like anybody else. But that's it, $2,800. One person, one vote. You got a corporation puts in $10 million. Yeah, they may only be voting one time, the CEO of that company. But you're influencing many people with that kind of money. So it's disingenuous to pretend that that money is not the cause of the problem. But just right. saying, well, it's just free speech. No, it's not. Right. And also going back to my, my point earlier about economies of scale, you know, if, if you are in the uber wealthy, you know, donating a million dollars to a campaign or even donating a hundred thousand dollars to a campaign could be the equivalent of the average person donating five or $10. So it's the, the money seems exactly. really, really it's high, but it's right, exactly it's, and, and, you know, again, going back to my incentives and decentives comment, uh, what is like, you know, as far as cost factor analysis, what's the easiest way to assure up your industry? Well, why don't you just make sure that you're, you know, have a good ear with the people who are regulating you? Right. Congress definitely is not very good at regulating itself. No. <laughs> That's part of the problem. Right. And, and I, I mean, as you, I, you, I don't know if you know, Congress exempts itself from most of the laws that they pass. I don't know if you know that. 
I did, yeah. And and we actually saw that playing yeah. out, which again kind of got uh, cycled out of the news. But you know, once the intelligence briefings on coronavirus started coming out, there was a lot of senators who were making moves on their stock portfolios, which is actually right. which is legal for them to do, which which seems kind of strange because right. it's, it's definitely insider trading, and it's insider trading at the stake of the lives in which they're they're sworn to protect. Absolutely, and they kind of shrug it off like, well, we're allowed. Yeah, no, and it's <laughs> you're and, only and, allowed because nobody's held you accountable for not obeying the same laws you make stockbrokers obey. Yeah, I know it's <laughs> it's I don't know. It seems like an uphill battle sometimes, you know, just speaking practically. And it's I don't understand why you would be pro crime while pretending to be pro law and order. That's crime, you know. Rich people stealing more money is a crime, uh, but white collar crime is ninety percent of the cost of crime but only about 10% of the incarcerations. I think that yeah. that point is huge. You rob a, yeah, you, you rob a liquor store, you're going away for 10 years. You rob somebody's pension fund, it, you, you might get a fine. Or what about if Maybe you do. what about if you leave a bunch of uh, dredges open that uh, soak water away from wetlands and now there's you know, yeah, 100, 100 you homes that just got Yep, and 100 homes just yeah. got underwater that they don't have flood insurance. So what, what happens to those 100 homes? They keep donating to the guy who let it happen. That's what or happens. they just don't vote, right? <laughs> or they don't vote because they say right. politicians don't do nothing. Well, right. you're voting for the wrong ones. <laughs> yeah, right, 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 right. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy, right? Sorry. There is a difference, and it's not, and I, this is not me rah-rah in politics, but there is a difference in, in, in politicians. There, I do believe, and because I know a lot now, especially, uh, being in politics. I know a lot of freshman uh, candidates, you know, first time candidates, and most of them are really ideolo uh, ideological, uh, driven by ideology. They all mean well. They all, you know, we're going to go change the world. We're going to do this. And it's like, where does that cynicism set in? Where does that, I don't know. And I will never know unless I win it, and then I'm going to see that process. Will they change me? No, I'm a stubborn bastard. But will they, I, you see how everybody comes in gangbusters and you know all these guys are corrupt and we got to fix this and then the same things happen so uh, you know obviously it's systemic um uh, what what can be done to fix the system and i do believe that some you know aoc other parts of the country but nevertheless i do appreciate that she seems to be trying to bring pragmatism to politics which is <laughs> that's just hard to do obviously it is so but i think your your thoughts but, and the motivation for you running of if there is more more like average americans in the body you know in the body of congress then you know rising rising tide of of uh sense making right. perhaps will will kind of raise all ships right i think so because i think each successive generation like you know my 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 children's generation each one's a little bit more more hopefully you would think a little bit more knowledgeable a little bit more savvy uh about what you really need to do and and not doing the same things over and over is important so i do think i have great hopes but i had great hopes for gen x you know when we had bill clinton in 92 we we were going to change the world and rock the vote <coughs> and here we are <laughs> well, you know, uh, one of the uh, really big things that excites me about you, and it's only excited me more since since talking to you, is that you you check your own idealism. It seems like I wanted to go back to that comment you made about when you back when you were an idealistic uh, person working on the Bill Clinton campaign. What what's changed yeah. your idealism? Why why wouldn't you consider yourself as idealistic as you were back in I think you said ninety three? Oh, I'm still idealistic, but uh, I'm a little bit more cynical about. Uh, can I do it? You know, hmm. um, I believe in myself, but you know, is this system going to beat me or break me? I don't know. Uh, I wouldn't, I'm, I'm willing to bet on me. <laughs> I, I generally have been pretty good at everything I've done, but I see it happening. So that's the, the realism, the cynical part. Like maybe there's more that I just don't know yet going on back there that, you know, it's an unfixable system. I don't know. I can't, I can't lie and pretend that, oh, you just need more Democrats. You know, that's not, uh, obviously not the case. Now, under Democratic presidents, obviously the economy does better, but that's just historical data. That's not ideology. But, you know, having 
people who aren't in it for their own aggrandizement or greed, humans are humans. They tend to have self-interest. I'm, I'm anomalous in that way. I, I don't care about money. I have no interest in it. Yeah, I think perhaps your life experience than, has some you know, play food. into that. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, I've always been able to earn a living. I've never, you know, I've always been able to do something. And I'll dig a ditch if I have to, you know, uh, no matter what. Uh, I'm not too proud to work. So, and that's, a, that's, that's why I don't have that sort of insecurity about being wealthy or I, I don't care. My wife and I have always tried to help people. If we got a hundred bucks left and our neighbor needs 50, then we got 50 bucks left, you know. That's kind of how we are. We just, we're not worried about it. Uh, I can always make more money. I can't, uh, you know, make uh, any more human lives. We made two. We had two kids. That's enough. But, uh, you know, I have a lot money of faith has never been. I have sure, a lot of faith in you winning. That. And, uh, you know, like the thing that I would say is uh, uh, pensioning myself a bit of a philosopher. I, I don't believe in hope. I think hope is something that... Uh, it's like a, a passive thing that you, you submit your power into and saying like, I'm just going to accept that. I'm going to, I'm going to hope this is better yeah, where, that, where faith that, is something fair. that's yeah. an active thing, right? You have to actively be building, you have to actively be fueling and you have to actively be aware of its blind spots. And I think that that's what I'm hearing you say actually is you have faith in yourself and you, you don't have faith in the broader <laughs> means of what you, you can do, but it's through the faith in yourself and what you're physically doing that you're hoping to make a difference. And I think that that's beautiful. Yeah action oriented pretty much yeah. like our whole life yeah yeah That's yeah great. i don't like to <laughs> i don't like to wait for something to happen well i appreciate that um you know thank you so much for taking the time to talk with me i uh, i really appreciate that and and i have one more question for you but you know i, I hope in the next coming weeks and months as, as your campaign comes up maybe we can do like a, a check-in again it doesn't doesn't have to be that long but uh i definitely want to touch upon uh some more of your, your healthcare uh, points, like healthcare as infrastructure. I think that that, that, that concept you yeah. have is great. And also some like the mental health, mental health and autism uh, issues you've spoken yeah. on. I would love to talk to you about that some other time if you, uh, if you have some time available. In the uh, sure, uh, we can generally, I mean, at this point of the schedule, we, we talk to people, that's what we do. Excellent, um, yeah, we'll, so, we'll have to set that so up. But you, as a closing yeah, question, what kind of another, guitar do you play? Sure. Uh, bass guitar, actually, it's a Fender Squire 1986 model. Nice. I, I do also, I do also play uh, uh, six string, uh, but that's secondary. You know, like fiddling around on the acoustic and piano. Uh, but my main instrument when I was in a band was uh, bass guitar. Nice. I don't know if you can see the video right now, but I actually just bought myself a bass. I play. Uh, oh, did you? What kind? I bought myself an Ibanez, and uh, what is that? Ah, okay. SDGR. It's like the 500 series. Uh, I played that the one, like, I always thought they were a little thin. That's why I like the Squire, the fatter sound. But that was just personal. You know, you know actually, I play guitar. Um, I play guitar for a long time. And I, I wanted something a little thinner that I could put more effects oh, okay. layering over it. Sure, um, sure. So that actually, and then tonally, it's a very wide range. So I'm, I'm, I'm very, very pleased with it. I just got it a couple weeks ago. It's, it's very nice. Oh, okay. Well, I'm a little out of touch. The Fender, I have fat, big fat hands. I don't know. <laughs> You can see the scale when I was on video, but the Fender Squire had a nice big fat flat uh, fretboard that right. just kind of fell right in my hands. Whereas that, yeah, the Ibanez was a little thinner for me. Uh, but you know, God bless. <laughs> yeah, I know. I played jazz like making most of that my music, life. man. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I played jazz most of my yeah. life, and that thin neck with you can use your thumb, yeah. right? So like having yeah. a thinner neck, that's just like a lot easier of a transmission for me to be able to get into it. Oh, well, that's, so, that's fair. Yeah. Well, I'd love to talk shop with you about guitar as well. Uh, bass. Sure, it's always great to sure. talk with, uh, talk music with somebody, especially someone as varied as yourself. You you definitely are a Renaissance man yourself there, uh, Rob. Uh, so, so I've heard, yeah. <laughs> also an author, painter, builder, bricklayer. <laughs> yeah. I don't mess with electrical. I'm not an electrician. But, but about anything else, I can do it. Well, I can get you covered on that side. Ah, okay, good. <laughs> That's a, like when my sister wanted rewiring in her house. I was like, eh, I don't really do that. I'll get you an electrician. I'll change out <laughs> the pipes or something if you want. Or, you know, I'll definitely put a new roof on. You know. <laughs> yeah, oh, it was, that, that was part of employment for me when I was uh, jumping trades. It was a matter of I want to learn something and, you know, why not get paid to do it while you're doing it? So uh, drilling didn't interest me until I started doing it. And then I realized what a, what a fascinating uh, field geology is 
kind of just led me down that whole rabbit hole into environmental remediation and really learning about what's under the ground when you're talking about gas stations being in a corner for 50 years. Right. Uh, people, you know, people don't know the contamination underneath and I assure you it's there. Right. Uh, I've dug it out. Mud that smells like gas 50 feet deep. So yeah. Anyway. Yeah. We can talk about all that. Chris. No, I would love to talk about that too. I mean, that's, I mean, so like one of my big uh, passion areas is, you know, the environment obviously. And the reason why yeah. it is so big of a passion area of mine is because I think my lifetime, and I don't have any children, but I plan on it, but I, I'm pretty sure my children's lifetime is going to be most defined by the turbulence with the air, literally the air around us um, and what that is. You're, you're not wrong. Us. And I, I think that, that is, that's why it's the issue that I probably focus on the most. Um, and things like this, like, you know, I think unintended consequences and second and third order effects are concepts that we need to be talking about with everything. But I think in partic yeah. particular... <laughs> economy tied to our environment is one that we're, I mean, the, the bill is coming due. And, and, I, and things yeah. like what you're saying yeah. is like the, the complete decentralized nature of all of this uh, fossil fueled infrastructure and its effects on the land. Like, sure, we're seeing microplastics now in the Arctic, like that, that things like that have been going on in our soil, like to your example of, you know, uh, gas stations on the corner for 50 years, or, you know, that we've been using petrochemicals on a on a farm to, you know, for as fertilizer or pesticides, like what is that doing? You know, um, right. It, that's, it's all in a row. Oh yeah. The next, yeah. Then you should remind me the next time I'll tell you about a project in Gettysburg where they found a uh, oil drum that had been buried back in the last turn of the century and <laughs> built houses over it. That's a <sighs> wow. tale for another day. Yeah. Let's start the next one with that then. We can go into <laughs> sure, Gettysburg. Some... Just remind me of that. I'm going to write down remind Gettysburg. Gettysburg. Well, That's all you have to write down. It was a fucking hot mess. <laughs> I don't think it made the news, but uh, yeah, I'll tell you about it. Yeah. I yeah, people the, don't realize. You think, I think the oh, biggest things that, don't make the news, right? Yeah, you know, all that waste and all that stuff. You think it just gets handled? Sure. <laughs> yeah, it gets handled. Yeah, you know, um, something that I would love to just deposit, You're drinking in, it. deposit in your mind is that the, so the United States, when we were doing a lot of nuclear tests in Nevada, uh, uh -huh. we we took all of the soil from Nevada and we actually moved it to an island in the Marshall Islands and then we covered mm -hmm. it with concrete. Um, yep. Well, that was about like 70 years ago, 65 years ago. Well, that concrete is starting to crack. It's starting to leak and the water level because of climate change and sea level rise is actually rising to cover the island. So about, awesome. yeah, about a hundred or I think it's like, it's several, nuclear tests worth of soil is now covered in a leaking concrete dome in the Marshall Islands that is soon to be underwater. Awesome. So the Pacific Ocean becomes Chernobyl, right? Potentially the world, right? Because jet streams aren't localized. Well, that's what I meant. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. The, the after effects of Chernobyl. People exactly. think that Chernobyl was cleaned up and then we know better. It was not cleaned up. You can't clean it up. No. And the, it, and it was the buried. Yes, and the effects to broader Europe that happened for those like couple years right. afterwards were never really talked the about. But it's, clusters. Yeah. Yes, but yeah. they were definitely there. Yep. Uh, but yeah, I'm happy to talk. I'm, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm fairly well read, so I'll talk on any of those subjects you want. Sure. Awesome. Well, you know, let's have another another time. I'll I'll work with uh, your your team to schedule it out. Maybe we can schedule it for like a, a couple weeks out now, just to kind of have it together. And thank you again, Rob, yeah, for, talk for to, talking. Talk, sure. Talk to Dave and we'll get you hooked up. No problem. Awesome. So I'm, I'm going to cut the recording here. So uh, I'll, I'll okay. like, stop the interview, but we can chat for a second. Um, thank you so much, sure. Rob. I, I, I was You're telling my well. wife when Dave uh, contacted me, I was like super ecstatic to talk to you. because uh, <laughs> I've never actually met somebody that I've been following so much on Twitter. Uh, so uh, it, okay. was, it was great to, <laughs> great to talk with you. And, you know, honestly, you come across cool. even more cool. personable in person than you do on your Twitter. So I, I'm really excited to get this out there. Yeah, and make sure you tell people that because you know, that's, that's what we're selling, reality. Yeah. That's uh, the decision I made when we started it a couple of years ago. I was like, well, why don't we just try let Rob be Rob? You I know, love it. Uh, let Bartlett be Bartlett. When the political exactly. <laughs> and the political team was like, well, you got to not do that. I said, no, 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 seriously, just let me do my thing. And then we'll see how it plays for the first year. And of course it blew up. So. Now they keep trying to correct me and they go, ah, fuck it, never mind. <laughs> awesome. I love it. Keep Do doing it. Yeah. yeah, keep yeah. doing it. All right, brother. That's great.
Well, Thank thanks you. boss. I really appreciate it. I'll, uh, I'll be in touch pretty soon and you have a, a safe rest of your day and I'm really rooting for you all in Louisiana. Thank you. I appreciate that. I do. All right. Take care, Rob. Thank you.